It's the Adam Ragusea podcast, episode 69. Nice. Let me ask you something. What's harder, baking or cooking? This is, to me, a really interesting question, because I think that it might be like the exact same question as what's harder, STEM or the humanities? STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. What's harder, STEM or the humanities? Math class versus art class. Science class versus literature. Which is harder? I think that baking versus cooking is an almost perfectly parallel question. And of course, it's a question with no one answer. Difficulty is subjective, as is any ultimate definition of success in food preparation. Therefore, one pursuit cannot be said to be harder for everyone everywhere. It depends on the context. It depends on the person. It depends on the person's individual interpretation of the question and of the factors one would consider to muster an answer. And of course, now we have yet another perfectly parallel question to ask. Which is harder? Questions for which the answer is elusive versus questions that have no one answer. That's STEM versus humanities in a nutshell. Also, baking versus cooking. Kind of. One thing I can tell you for sure is that when I am developing recipes for my YouTube channel, the baking recipes usually take a lot longer. I cannot go into a baking recipe with like two days until deadline. I have to leave myself at least one full day to do like a dozen test bakes before I can even begin production of the actual video. In contrast with cooking recipes, sometimes I can get away with doing a single practice run before I shoot. I still would not call cooking easier. I might say that it's harder to develop baking recipes, but it does not necessarily follow that baking is harder, since most of the baking that gets done in this world every day is from established, time-tested recipes. Few people ever need to develop new baking recipes themselves. And here, we must start to untangle our terminology before we can proceed, because cooking and baking are almost meaningless if taken at face value, right? A broad definition of cooking might be the act of preparing food for consumption. And anything that we could call baking would obviously fall under that definition of cooking. So that can't be what anybody actually means by cooking, since we have now set up cooking and baking in opposition to one another. A more narrow definition of cooking might be the act of preparing food with heat, which would also encompass baking, because baking is the act of preparing food by dry heat without direct exposure to flame, typically in an oven, quoth the Oxford English Dictionary. Preparing food with heat. Baking sure sounds like cooking to me. But that is the OED's 1A definition of bake. Let's go on down to the 1B definition, which is to prepare and cook food, in later use especially bread, cakes, pastries, etc., in this way. To prepare it in this way. So, while we may prepare all kinds of foods with dry, indirect heat, well, baking in contemporary English refers specifically to the preparation of bread, cakes, and pastries with dry, indirect heat. When we cook vegetables or meat with dry, indirect heat, we usually call that roasting. You can throw a loaf of bread into the oven and it's baking. And then you can throw a skewer of vegetables into that very same oven at that very same time, and it will be roasting. We're verbing two different verbs in the same place at the same time via the same means. How does that work? It's because baking equals the thing you do with breads and cakes and pastries, even when we don't bake them, even when we fry them or steam them, we still call it baking. That's how strong the association between the word and those kinds of foods has gotten in today's English. 
Baking equals breads, cakes, and pastries. My waffle recipe from a few weeks ago, was that a baking recipe? I thought of it as a baking recipe in my head, but a waffle iron uses direct heat, not indirect heat. You don't put the waffle in a box of hot air to bake. You smash it between two pieces of hot metal to, in essence, fry. Go into any large Western recipe depository and search in the baking section for no-bake cookies or no-bake cakes, and you will probably find several recipes. No-bake cookies in the baking section? Is baking just the act of making dessert? I'm not sure about that. Ice cream is dessert. One of the most popular desserts in the world. Is ice cream a baked good? I don't think anyone would call it that. Bread making is a kind of baking. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Is bread dessert? Sometimes, but not usually, right? In traditional French-style restaurant organization, there is usually a distinction between baking and pastry. The bread baker may work underneath the umbrella of the pastry department, or the baker may be a department unto themselves. But in a restaurant operated in the French style, which is like a whole lot of restaurants, baking usually refers to savory breads. And pastry refers to desserts. Even desserts that do not involve pastry. Pastry being a malleable dough made of flour and a watery liquid and usually lots of fat and sometimes sugar. Ice cream actually is pastry in this context, even though ice cream usually contains no pastry. Custard is pastry, meringue is pastry, etc., because they all come from the pastry department of the restaurant kitchen. Is a savory pie a pastry? Like what we'd call in North America a chicken pot pie, a savory stew baked with a layer of short crust or like puff pastry or or biscuit dough on top. I imagine in some French style kitchens, it is the pastry department's responsibility to make the dough for the chicken pies, but it's probably the chefs over in the cooking area who actually drape that dough over the stew and throw the whole thing in the oven to cook by means of indirect heat. Is it baking or roasting in there? It's chicken which suggests roasting, but it's also dough, which suggests baking. I feel like if we keep pursuing this particular question, we might create a singularity that sucks in our entire region of the galaxy. The point is, baking is not necessarily dessert, and it's not necessarily the thing you do with an oven. What is it, necessarily? What's the common denominator of all of these recipes deemed baking? Are they all based on grain? I don't know. I can think of a lot of grain-based dishes that no one would call baking dishes, like a bowl of steamed rice, or oatmeal, or farro, or noodles, pasta, dumplings, etc. All of those are grain-based. All of them you could prepare in the oven. None of them are baked goods. Are baked goods based on grain flour, specifically? Like a bowl of farro grains, whole wheat grains boiled soft, like that porridge is not considered a baked good. Most of the things we do call baked goods are based on grains that have been dried and ground into a fine powder, i.e. flour. Bread is based on flour. Cakes are based on flour. True pastries are based on flour, etc. So is baking whatever you do with flour? I don't know. Dumplings are usually based on flour, and that's not baking. Gravy is often based on a flour roux, and that's not baking. Pasta is just flour and water. Pasta isn't a baked good. Also, what would flourless cake and cookies be? Like If I make a video about how to make meringue cookies, which are delicious and chewy and naturally gluten-free because they're based on egg white and sugar, not flour... If I make those cookies, you will think of that as being a baking recipe, even though there is no flour. 
Baking usually involves flour, but flour is not exclusive to baking, and baking is not exclusive to flour. As is generally the case with words, the definitions are less like categories and more like clusters or clouds of associated ideas, all orbiting around a common but undefined, purely theoretical center. Any definition of baking we could hammer out here will have some obvious exceptions. But here's what I think baking is. This is my definition of baking. Baking is when you take a loose mass of food, usually grain flour based, and you convert this loose mass into a solid, usually an airy solid, usually by means of dry indirect heat. This definition could conceivably include dumplings and noodles and pasta, but those foods are rarely cooked with dry heat, therefore this definition does not favor them. Also, noodles and pasta are not airy on the inside. They are super solid. Dumplings sometimes have a little air on the inside. Noodles and dumplings could fit under my definition, but they would fit more comfortably under some other words definition. Baking is the act of converting a loose mass of usually flour-based food into a solid, usually an airy solid, usually by means of dry heat. This definition does not exclude meringues and no-bake cookies, but it does not favor them either. I said baking usually involves dry heat, no-bake cookies require no heat, and I did say that baking usually involves grain flour, no flour in meringue cookies. But that's why we say usually in a definition. There are exceptions to the rules. Meringue cookies and no-bake cookies are made to imitate the taste and texture of normal baked wheat flour-based cookies. So that's why I would put them in the bakery section. They would fit under the definition of baked goods more comfortably than they would fit under any other term's definition. I think this act of converting a loose blob into a solid is really key to baking. And it's why developing a baking recipe is so much harder than developing most other kinds of recipes. Most other recipes you can change as you go. If I'm working on a stew and I think it's too thick, too stiff, I can just stir in some water or some stock and the problem is instantly fixed. If the stew is too thin, I can boil it down to evaporate off some water, or I can stir in some starch slurry to thicken it. There's a few fatal mistakes I could make with a stew, like burning it. It's very hard to save a stew after you have let the bottom scorch horribly. It's hard to save a stew into which you have poured way, way too much of some very powerful ingredient, like salt. But even then... If you put in twice as much salt as you want, you could just add more other stuff, more vegetables, more stock, whatever, and just double the mass in the pot to match the double dose of salt that you threw in. It is possible to save. But even that scenario is relatively unlikely because you probably wouldn't pour double the salt into the stew. There's no reason to guess the amount of salt. You can always stir in more salt. So you start with just a pinch, you stir, you taste, add another little pinch if necessary, and you keep going until it's perfect. Baking isn't like that. Baking involves this magical conversion from liquid to solid. You can stir additional compensatory ingredients into a liquid, but not a solid. Nor can you take ingredients out of a solid. Whatever is in the batter or the dough at the time that it goes into the oven is what's going to come out in your finished solid baked good, and you won't be able to take the salt out if you accidentally doubled it. It's baked into the cake, as it were. Baked into the cake being an idiom meaning irreversibly merged. An advertisement that YouTube plays before or after my videos is not baked into the cake. You may see a different ad the next time you watch that video, or you may see no ad at all. In contrast, 
an ad that I present personally within my video or podcast is baked into the cake. And you know what goes great with cake is some trade coffee. Sponsor of this episode. Get a free bag of coffee with any subscription purchase right now at drinktrade.com slash Adam show. Hey, real quick side note. Trade sponsored a video on my channel the other day. It was the one about space ice cream. Lots of people have asked about the brewing technique that I did in that, that ad of that vid. I have no idea if it has a name, but I just brought a measuring cup of water to a boil in the microwave, right? Just a measuring, like a pint or no, quart measuring jug of water in, to boil in the microwave. And I just sat a fine mesh strainer inside that hot water. I dumped the coffee grounds into the strainer. I stirred once. I waited eight minutes. I lifted the strainer out and there's my coffee left behind. This technique is essentially the same as brewing with a French press. That's all that's happening inside a French press. I love the French press, but it's really a glorified strainer. All you have to do to brew coffee is to submerge the grounds in hot water, wait, and then strain. Lots of different kinds of strainers will work, including some that are commonly found in kitchens, any fine sieve. That doesn't mean more sophisticated brewing methods are pointless. I love a Chemex. I love an AeroPress. But great coffee does not have to be complicated or difficult, and Trade helped me to learn as much. Trade is a coffee discovery service that sets you up with a steady stream of freshly roasted coffees, chosen for your tastes and sent directly to you on your schedule by the local independent roaster that actually roasted it within 48 hours of shipping. Trade doesn't make coffee or warehouse coffee or anything like that. What they do is taste a million different coffees all the time to find the best, the most interesting stuff for you and your tastes. Whole bean, pre-ground, calf or decaf, light or dark roast, natural or washed process, there's something for everybody. Some things, plural, for everybody. A trade subscription is great for the serious coffee drinker, but it's also great for the novice, which I was when I first started getting trade bags sent to the house. My subscription helped me to learn which styles and roasts of coffee I like. I like light roast, natural process as coffee is best. And it helped me to learn lots of different ways to brew a cup at home, including some that confuse people on the internet. I could not recommend a trade subscription any higher to anybody who loves coffee or who might love coffee. Get a free bag with any subscription purchase at drinktrade.com slash Adam show. That's drinktrade.com slash Adam show to let them know that the Ragusia pod sent you. Thank you, trade. Anyway, bacon versus cooking. Here's why it's so hard to develop baking recipes. It's because you have to guess. You have to guess on the ingredient proportions and the process and the method and such. And you have to guess on the oven temperature and the oven conditions. You have to make your best guess. And then you have to just let the thing bake for an hour or however long it takes. And then you have to pull it out and let it cool before you can assess how well you guessed. I mean, we make educated guesses based on how flour and water and such generally react in certain proportions, but it's still a best guess. And if you guessed poorly... You have to mix up another batch and go through all other 90-minute baking and cooling cycle to find out if you have fixed the problem. In contrast, if my salad dressing needs more vinegar, I know immediately that it needs more vinegar, and I can find out how much more vinegar it needs instantly by just mixing in more vinegar to taste. I will say... You can bring some of that uh, efficiency to the world of baking by tasting your raw batters and doughs. I do that all the time as a matter of like vocational necessity. It comes with some risk of foodborne illness because raw flour and raw eggs can be contaminated with E. coli and such, but people take risks for their jobs all the time and I am no different. You can, of course, do a quick test bake on a batter. Just fry up like a tiny dollop of it on a pan on your stove or like steam a little cake of it in a bowl in the microwave. That's a great way to test really quickly if you've gotten the salt content right, for example. But the success of a baked good is not limited to its flavor being right or off. You're also looking for a dough or a batter to 
perform in a certain way, to rise big and fluffy in the oven, or to spread thin and crispy, or to steam up without browning, or to brown as much as possible on the outside while keeping the inside almost raw, or to come out super chewy, or to come out soft and crumbly and not chewy at all, or whatever it is you're looking for in the solid mass that you're making from your wet, grain-based mixture. You really can't assess the quality of your dough or your batter recipe until you've baked it up all the way and then cooled it back down again. And by the time you realize something is terribly wrong, it's too late to do anything about it. Your mistake is baked into the cake. You cannot course correct midair when baking. And to me, that's the biggest thing that makes baking so difficult. Baking is like firing an artillery piece like you can spend all day aiming that thing but once you fire the shell is gonna go wherever it's gonna go you have had your last say in the matter once you've pulled the trigger it's kind of like parenting cooking is usually more like firing a guided missile where you can steer it from the launch all the way home A baking recipe and a cooking recipe that I'm developing may each require a dozen course corrections, but with the cooking recipe, I can do all 12 course corrections in the same practice run. With a baking recipe, 12 course corrections means there will be 12 different cakes in my house that day, and most of them will be bad. Certainly, we encounter points of no return in our cooking as well as our baking, but far more of them in baking. Here's another thing that makes baking harder. Success is often a little less subjective in baking. Like if I'm cooking a steak, I might cook it rare, I might cook it medium well, and in either case, I could pass off the result as being intentional because lots of people like their steak on either end of that spectrum and everywhere in between. And I genuinely like steak at different levels of doneness. Maybe not medium well, but medium, medium rare or rare. I like a blue steak every now and then, usually when it's very high quality, but very lean beef. If you cook it blue and slice it really thin, it's like beef tataki. Blue means totally raw on the inside, right? In contrast, there's almost no one who likes bread that doesn't rise. I mean, unleavened bread is a thing. It's God's chosen bread. And crackers exist. But those are different dough recipes. If you make like a normal yeast dough recipe and it doesn't rise in the oven, the result is something that nobody likes. I have a video of a pizza dough experiments, set of experiments that I did a while back. And one thing that I tried was leaving out the yeast entirely and seeing if the steam in my very high hydration dough would inflate the dough at least a little in the oven, and it did not. The result tasted like wet cardboard. There are more cases of objective failure in the baking world. We get those sometimes in the cooking world, usually when we massively overcook something, or when we break an emulsion for a sauce or something, but... Other than those cases, food is generally pretty easy to cook, especially if you keep an open mind about what the final result is going to be. And you can make all kinds of mid-flight course corrections if you don't like how things are turning out. But in baking, the souffle either falls or it doesn't. And they have a tendency to fall, even when you do most things right or even when you do all the things mostly right. The souffle still has a tendency to fall. Small margin for error in a souffle. Did the layers inside the croissants separate and puff up in the oven, or did they all stick together? If you let your dough get too warm, the layers will melt together, and then the dough won't rise at all in the oven. That is a case of clear catastrophic objective failure and it's a very real possibility as anyone who's ever worked with laminated doughs in a warm climate can tell you so in that sense 
I think it's fair to say that baking is harder than cooking in the same way that math class is harder than art class. Whichever type of skill you value, consider hiring your next employee with Indeed, sponsor of this episode. More than 80% of people looking for jobs online in the U.S. search Indeed for opportunities every month, according to Comscore. The talent is there. Just go get them at Indeed.com slash Ragusea. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Indeed has streamlined hiring with powerful tools that find you perfectly matched candidates. With Instant Match, more than 80% of employers see quality candidates whose resume matches the job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed's U.S. data. And you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. Once you've got a match... You can reach out to this person through Indeed. You can encourage them personally to apply for your job right there in Indeed. You can do a virtual interview through Indeed. You can assign skill tests for your candidate to take. Indeed delivers four times more hires than all other job sites combined, according to Talent Nest. That's why more than three million businesses use Indeed worldwide. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Ragusia. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 job credit right now at Indeed.com slash Ragusia. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Anyway, I think it's fair to say that baking is harder than cooking in the same way that math class is harder than art class. Creative art class. If it's like a technical drawing class, then it's on equal footing with math class vis-a-vis this particular comparison that I am drawing. In technical drawing, you either get a straight edge or you don't. You either get a perfect circle of the correct diameter within a certain reasonable range of possibility or you don't. It's the same way you either solve for X correctly in the equation or you don't. But if instead of technical drawing, it's a creative art class, it can be a little harder to say whether you have succeeded or failed in painting that feeling that you get when you smell your grandmother's cake baking. I mean, art teachers have all kinds of metrics they can assess in assigning a grade. Originality, color choice, mastery of technique, diversity of techniques, sloppiness, etc. But each of those is a big judgment call, with the possible exception of technique mastery, because you could, you could definitely objectively fail at doing pointillism or photorealism or all kinds of things. I don't really know art, sorry. I'm just the son of an art teacher. I think it's fair to say that art teachers have to make more debatable judgment calls when grading than math teachers do. Both have to make judgment calls, and both deal in some objective cases of success or failure, but the mix is really different when grading abstract sculptures versus trig tests. Does that mean art is easier than math? Well... You're more likely to get an A in art than you are in math, right? That might not be true in every educational system around the world, but it's generally true in contemporary Western schools that it's easier for most people to get an A in art than in math. That would indicate that art class is easier than math class. But is actually doing art easier than actually doing math? What if the context is not the classroom, but the free market? I think it's probably way harder to make a living as a creative artist than it is to be a professional math doer, an accountant, a bookkeeper, a data scientist. There's lots of really good math jobs out there. Fewer good fine art jobs. The free market would suggest that art is much more difficult given how few people are able to make a living with it. Painting something that satisfies your teacher's assignment is one thing. Painting something that moves millions of people is an entirely different thing. I consoled myself with that knowledge somewhat back when I was on faculty at Mercer University's Center for Collaborative Journalism. 
I taught there full time for five and a half years, and I never developed what I felt was a coherent, consistent, practicable philosophy of grading. Grading just made no sense to me. I mean, sometimes grading made sense to me. I taught lots of technical skills in my classes. It was usually pretty clear cut whether you recorded the interview with the mic right up to the source's mouth or if you recorded it from your hand draping lazily down by your side. It was pretty clear cut whether you followed the rule of thirds on that photo or whether you were able to create shallow depth of field, etc. I never felt weird about grading that kind of stuff. Those tests were always my favorite to grade because I knew what I had to do even if I didn't like doing it. I did not like giving bad grades, almost ever. But when we got past the basic skills stuff, I found it absurdly difficult to assign a grade that I could truly justify to myself. I could grade well enough to satisfy my dean, but not myself. It always felt inescapably arbitrary to me, assigning a grade based on how good a student news article was. Sure, I could devise a rubric, as they love to say in faculty meetings. Did the student journalist find an interesting person to interview? That's a yes or no question on a rubric. But how do you define interesting? Did the student reporter pull a compelling quote from the person that they interviewed? Yes or no, but what mean compelling, Rambo? Grading rubrics in the arts and humanities often look very rational and systematic and mathematic, but each metric is, at the root of it, a subjective judgment call on the part of the grader. My old public radio associate, Mike Pesca, who has a famous podcast now called The Gist, Pesca has a great analogy for that kind of like rubric. He says that it's like the signal poles in American football. In American football, the offensive team is always trying to advance the ball forward at least 10 yards at a time. They have four plays called downs in which to get the ball to the next 10-yard section of the field. And if they can't get it there in four downs, they have to forfeit the ball to the other team. If you do make it to the next 10-yard section of the field, you have achieved a first down, and you have three more to make it to the next 10-yard section. How do the game officials know if you've made the first down? Well, they have a 10-yard chain with bright orange rods on either end. The first guy in the chain crew stakes his rod where the ball started. The other guy walks in a straight line until the chain is taut, and he stakes his rod, and they see where the ball ended up in relation to that second rod. It all looks very scientific and objective, but it's actually an objective construct built upon a subjective foundation. That being, where exactly does the first guy stake his little pole? If he puts it in the wrong spot, the whole measurement is wrong, even if they stretch out the chain perfectly straight and true. And where does the guy stake the pole in relation to the ball? Like, right along the middle of the ball? Or along the tip of the ball? Which tip? I'm sure the NFL has rules about that, but I'm also sure those rules leave at least some room for interpretation about where exactly you should put that rod. Every grading rubric I ever wrote for a creative assignment felt, at least partially, and sometimes substantially fraudulent to me. The rubric felt like a CYA policy, cover your ass. College students and or their parents feel very empowered nowadays to challenge grades, bad grades. They can make a lot of headaches for you, these folks. If you're on the faculty, if, if they fill out a form challenging the grade, then you have to fill out a form defending the grade. There might be a hearing. 
the dean or the faculty senate ultimately makes the call. And even if they rule in your favor, the administration is going to start looking askance at you if your grades keep getting challenged. They may deny it, perhaps earnestly, but the unspoken pressure to avoid grade challenges is unavoidable in any school. It's just a fact of life. If a student challenges one of your grades, it really helps to have documentation of your decision-making process. And that's what rubrics are. Rubrics are also things that you can put in your syllabi so that you can say that you fully informed your students of the standards that you'd expect from them, assuming they read the syllabus. And all of that is great, but the rubrics are still fundamentally fraudulent in my view. They're built on subjective foundations when it comes to creative work, among other human endeavors. Even if I gave a really clear-cut assignment, like write an article in inverted pyramid format to prove that you understand what inverted pyramid is, even if I gave an assignment clear-cut like that, grading was still super subjective. Inverted pyramid format means that you don't tell people what happened in chronological order. That would be a story, which you do in a feature. Rather, in inverted pyramid, you list facts about what happened in descending order of importance. Whatever the most important fact in a story is, you write that at the very beginning. Then you write down the second most important fact and the third, etc. Sounds cut and dry, but who's to say which part of the news is most important? Like, I know what's most important to me. But I'm a guy with my own inescapable point of view, and it would be foolish of me to assume that my point of view is the correct universal view simply because I'm the professor. Being the professor doesn't mean I'm right. It just means that I have power. Maybe a detail in a news story that seems trivial to me is like the most interesting thing to my 18-year-old student. Therefore, I'm not sure I can say for certain whether they successfully wrote an inverted pyramid piece. Some professors would say, the cool professors, they would say, well, if you can make a coherent argument as to why the story should lead with this fact and not that fact, then sure, you still get an A. But it's the professor who judges which arguments are coherent. It's all arbitrary. And I did not feel comfortable wielding the awesome power of bad grades on such flimsy pretense. Was that my honor and sense of justice? Or was it just that I was afraid of dealing with grade challenges? Probably a little of both columns there. But the best solution I could come up with was I became a real easy grader in the more advanced classes where students worked primarily on creative projects. Did you make the thing that I basically asked you to make on time? Great, you get an A. It's really not my place anymore to judge your work beyond that. I think lots of faculty in the arts and humanities come to similar conclusions about grading, even if they won't admit it to their dean. The humanities professors I knew who were notoriously hard graders mostly just seemed like jerks to me back when I taught for a living and I was around those people. The hard graders either liked giving bad grades a little bit too much and so they went out of their way to do it, or they seemed to have not sufficiently scrutinized whether the right answer really is the one right answer. Most times, I'm really not sure what the right answer is. I have my right answer some of the time, but rarely am I certain it's the only right answer. And even if it's something really basic, like, did you remember the names and dates of the five impressionist painters we discussed? Well, who's to say that those five painters are the ones that every student in a basic art history class should remember? One reason that I quit music school as a graduate student was I lost confidence in the ability of my professors to lead me to the important music. I thought the music that they were advancing as basic core literature that every student must study, I thought that a lot of that music just wasn't very interesting or important to me. 
and it didn't seem to be interesting or important to anybody else other than composition faculty. Yes, every field has its esoterica, but that doesn't mean the luminaries in every field are infallible in how they select their esoterica. Sometimes it's just random groupthink that positions a piece of art in the canon. Sometimes it's unearned privilege that positions a piece of art in the canon. Maybe there is no canon, and we should stop trying to make canon happen. Everyone has their own canon, their own corpus of creative work they value above others. And the job of university faculty is to help students form their own canon, not to passively accept the canon handed down by their mostly white upper class faculty. I think my imposter syndrome really served me well when I taught journalism for a living. It kept me humble. Er. I really did not enjoy wielding power over the lives of vulnerable young people, and all young people are vulnerable to one degree or another. I felt comfortable telling my students what's super interesting to me. I felt comfortable telling them why I love this writer or why I hate this photographer, etc. I could easily prepare lectures like that, and everybody seemed to love them. But when I had to turn around and demand that students learn this and not that, and learn to do it this way and not that way, I really felt that I had little, if any, standing, and that really undermines the basic model of school as we know it. I took solace in knowing that even if I contributed to grade inflation, even if I gave a terrible student reporter an A, they still would never be able to hack it in the workplace, and that's where it really matters, right? <clears throat> or maybe the student is like a late bloomer, and they're going to turn it around and kick ass in the real world. I've seen that happen more than once. I was not a particularly good student myself. As faculty, I figured, you know, students will rise and fall as they will in the real world, They'll end up eventually wherever they belong in our society and in our economy. It's not my place to keep them from trying. It's my place to set them up for success as best I can and to protect the value of my institution's imprimatur by not helping to grant degrees to students who are like facially unprepared. But if students showed up and did the thing, you usually gave them an A. And while I suspect my journalism classes were generally easier to pass than engineering classes, I will say that I had more than a few engineering majors take my classes, and when I told them that they had to go out and interview a stranger on the street, or call a stranger on the phone and ask permission to record an interview, oh, they completely melted down. I remember I had one computer science kid tell me, I'd rather take the F than walk up to a stranger on the street and ask them for an interview. <laughs> Fair enough, I guess. It's your nickel. I get paid either way. But if my students showed up and did the thing, I usually gave them an A in journalism class, even if I had doubts about their ability to do journalism in the real world. Let the free market sort out the rest, I figured. And I knew at the time that that was naive thinking. I just couldn't come up with anything better. I still can't. What's the best way to grade is a question without an answer. And it sure feels to me like such questions are harder than questions that do have an answer, elusive or unknowable as that answer may be. At least there's an answer out there somewhere. Those questions feel a lot easier to me than questions with no answer at all. And I kind of feel like, in a way, arts and humanities are more difficult than STEM subjects. Certainly, it's easier to skate by in humanities classes, that's definitely for sure. But there's more of a formula for success in engineering than there is in music, music. 
Like, lots of people know how to build a bridge that won't fall down. Absolutely no one knows how to write a hit song. There are people who know how to write something with a better than normal chance of becoming a hit song, but no one knows how to write a hit song. If they did, they'd be billionaires. Some pedant is going to be like, well, Dr. Dre and Paul McCartney are billionaires. So now I have to say that I love Dre and Paul, but Dre is a billionaire headphone company entrepreneur, not a billionaire music producer. And if we are to believe that Paul knows how to write a hit song, well, then how do we explain the lion's share of his solo material? Was he trying to write forgettable songs? I doubt it. Similarly, there are formulas you can follow for baking well. Baking is tricky. Lots of things can go objectively wrong. Margins for error are often very narrow. But perhaps precisely because all of those pitfalls, you can bake successfully without ever understanding why a cake bakes the way that it does. There are thorough, time-tested formulas you can simply follow, like a soldier carrying out orders, never thinking, never questioning. Just follow the recipe. Whereas cooking a perfect steak can be a lot trickier, first you have to define perfect. And it depends not only on the diner's preferences, but also on the kind of meat you have, which, which qualities of that meat you want to highlight, etc. How hot should the pan be? No one can say for sure. Burners and pans vary so much, and the right temperature can depend on the exact thickness of the steak and all other kinds of things that recipes cannot account for. The recipe can tell you to cook it to X temperature for medium rare, but it takes a lot of experience and intuition to tell when a steak has reached your target temperature. Even if you use a thermometer, yes. Thermometers give you radically different readings depending on the exact position wherever you've stuck your steak. I push it a little further in, it goes up 10 degrees. Which is the real reading? Even if you can perfectly identify center mass, do you really want to cook the steak based on how hot that one spot is getting? Maybe that's a small, thick spot, and most of the steak is thinner. So you'd do better to prioritize the thinner meat and just let that small, thick spot be really rare. So, many judgment calls. And who's to say which choices are right? Which results are proper? The way to cook a proper steak is, well, well, just stop talking right there, cowboy, because there literally is no such thing. And yes, you could say all the same things about a loaf of bread. But we're talking about tendencies, not absolutes. Baking and cooking are clouds, not categories. Kind of like male and female, come to think of it. Clouds of characteristics orbiting around purely theoretical centers, not discrete categories. Marco Pierre White likes to say, cooking isn't about recipes. He says, cooking is a philosophy. Unless it's pastry, then it's chemistry. Of course, all food preparation is chemistry. And there is philosophy behind every human endeavor. But I don't think Marco is saying that cooking is literally a kind of philosophy. He's saying that it's like philosophy in the sense that it's more debatable whether a philosophical work is good or bad. It's more debatable whether you're cooking that stew correctly than it is whether you're baking a cake that will rise in the oven and won't burn on the outside before it's done on the inside. And it's less debatable in chemistry whether you have devised the right chemical process or some such. I mean, I'm sure it's still potentially debatable for sure, which isomer of octane will perform best in this fuel system or whatever, but I think that's less debatable than who gets the criterion problem more wrong, the coherentists or the foundationalists? I have no idea if that was a coherent philosophical question that I just posed. I think it might have been word salad. Then again, I kind of think a lot of philosophical writing is word salad. <laughs> 
not of as much of it is word salad as people think, but I reckon a lot of it tends toward word salad. A lot of musicology and definitely tends toward word salad. Here's something I could say that will definitely piss off the philosophy department. When Marco says that cooking is a philosophy, baking is chemistry. Another thing he means is that the most promising path to success in cooking is to feel out the situation and to use your senses and your intuition. The most promising path to success in baking is learn the formula, follow the rules. The philosophy department would hate that comparison because it makes it sound like philosophy is all about feelings. And indeed, the philosophical discipline is generally much more rigid and systematic and mathy than the popular imagination would imagine. I do wonder if all their systems are basically like the 10-yard chain with the two poles on either end, an objective structure built on a subjective foundation. But I don't know well enough to say. I did quite poorly in my philosophy, Gen Ed, as I recall. Philosophy turned out to be far more rigid and systematized and mathy than I was expecting. Sure, a lot of undergraduates get the same rude awakening. And Marco Pierre White was not privileged enough to get to take a philosophy class, so... Let's check our own privilege before we snark at him for assuming that philosophy is more loosey-goosey than it actually is. I'm not here to say that cooking is harder than baking or that arts and humanities are harder than STEM subjects. I really don't know the answer. But I thought about that question at you for about an hour, and that passes for success in my field. So mission accomplished! Yay me! Another W in the column. How does he do it? All I do is win. Easy to do when you get to position the goalposts yourself. You know, the one thing that I failed to do this hour, I failed to develop any kind of coherent position on whether casseroles count as cooking or baking. I got nothing but questions there. Is a casserole a baked good or not? You tell me. Make good choices. I'll talk to you next time.